Next, we'll cover how to secure internal networks with proxy servers. Proxy servers are another system that helps secure networks. The definition of a proxy server is a server that fulfills the request of a client by forwarding them on to other servers. The proxy server is a dedicated server that sits between the internet and the rest of the network. When a request to connect to the network comes in from the internet, the proxy server will determine if the connection request is safe. The proxy server uses a public IP address that is different from the rest of the private network. This hides the private network's IP address from malicious actors on the internet and adds a layer of security. Let's examine how this will work with an example. When a client receives an HTTPS response, they will notice a distorted IP address or no IP address rather than the real IP address of the organization's web server. A proxy server can also be used to block unsafe websites that users aren't allowed to access on an organization's network. A proxy server uses temporary memory to store data that's regularly requested by external servers. This way, it doesn't have to fetch data from an organization's internal servers every time. This enhances security by reducing contact with the internal server. There are different types of proxy servers that support network security. This is important for security analysts who monitor traffic from various proxy servers and may need to know what purpose they serve. Let's explore some different types of proxy servers. A forward proxy server regulates and restricts a person's access to the internet. The goal is to hide a user's IP address and approve all outgoing requests. In the context of an organization, a forward proxy server receives outgoing traffic from an employee, approves it, and then forwards it on to the destination on the internet. A reverse proxy server regulates and restricts the internet's access to an internal server. The goal is to accept traffic from external parties, approve it, and forward it to the internal servers. This setup is useful for protecting internal web servers containing confidential data from exposing their IP address to external parties. An email proxy server is another valuable security tool. It filters spam email by verifying whether a sender's address was forged. This reduced the risk of phishing attacks that impersonate people known to the organization. Let's talk about a real-world example of an email proxy. Several years ago, when I was working at a large US broadband ISP, we used a proxy server to implement multiple layers of anti-spam filtering before the message was allowed in for delivery. It ended up tagging around 95% of messages as spam. The proxy server is what allowed us to filter and then scale those filters without impacting the underlying email platform. Proxy servers play an important part in network security. By filtering incoming and outgoing traffic and staying alert to network attacks, these devices add a layer of protection from unsecured public network that we call the internet. Now you'll learn how to secure networks so that the valuable information they contain doesn't get into the wrong hands. We're going to discuss how network intrusion tactics can present a threat to networks and how a security analyst can protect against network attacks. Let's get started. Let's start by answering the question, why do we need to secure networks? As you've learned, networks are constantly at risk of attack from malicious actors. Attackers can infiltrate networks via malware, spoofing, or packet sniffing. Network operations can also be disrupted by attacks such as packet flooding. As we go along, you're going to learn about these and other common network intrusion attacks in more detail. Protecting a network from these types of attacks is important. If even one of them happens, it could be a catastrophic impact on an organization. Attacks can harm an organization by leaking valuable or confidential information. They can also be damaging to an organization's reputation and impact customer retention. Mitigating attacks may also cost the organization money and time. Over the last few years, there have been a number of examples of damage that cyber attacks can cause. One notorious example was an attack against the American home improvement chain, Home Depot, in 2014. A group of hackers compromised and infected Home Depot's servers with malware. By the time network administrators shut down the attack, the hackers had already taken the credit and debit card information for over 56 million customers. Now you know why it's so important to secure a network. But to keep a network secure, you need to know what kinds of attacks to protect it from. Coming up, you'll learn about some common network attacks. We are going to discuss denial of service attacks. A denial of service attack is an attack that targets a network or server and floods it with network traffic. The objective of a denial of service attack, or a DOS attack, 
It's to disrupt the normal business operations by overloading an organization's network. The goal of the attack is to send so much information to a network device that it crashes or is unable to respond to legitimate users. This means that the organization won't be able to conduct their normal business operations, which can cost them money and time. A network crash can also leave them vulnerable to other security threats and attacks. A distributed denial of service attack, or DDoS, is a kind of DOS attack that uses multiple devices or servers in different locations to flood the target network with unwanted traffic. Use of numerous devices makes it more likely that the total amount of traffic sent will overwhelm the target server. Remember, DOS stands for denial of service. So it doesn't matter what part of the network the attacker overloads, if they overload anything, they win. An unfortunate example I've seen is an attacker who crafted a very careful packet that caused a router to spend extra time processing the request. The overall traffic volume didn't overload the router. The specifics within the packet did. Now we'll discuss network level DOS attacks that target network bandwidth to slow traffic. Let's learn about three common network level DOS attacks. The first is called a SYN flood attack. A SYN flood attack is a type of DOS attack that simulates the TCP connection and floods a server with SYN packets. So let's break this definition down a bit more by taking a closer look at the handshake process that is used to establish a TCP connection between a device and a server. The first step in the handshake is for the device to send a SYN, or synchronize, request to the server. Then the server responds with a SYN ACK packet to acknowledge the receipt of the device's request and leaves a port open for the final step of the handshake. Once the server receives the final ACK packet from the device, a TCP connection is established. Malicious actors can take advantage of the protocol by flooding a server with SYN packet requests for the first part of the handshake. But if the number of SYN requests is larger than the number of available ports on the server, then the server will be overwhelmed and become unable to function. Let's discuss two other common DOS attacks that use another protocol called ICMP. ICMP stands for Internet Control Message Protocol. ICMP is an internet protocol used by devices to tell each other about data transmission errors across the network. Think of ICMP like a request for a status update from a device. The device will return error messages if there is a network concern. You can think of this like the ICMP request checking in with the device to make sure that all is well. An ICMP flood attack is a type of DOS attack performed by an attacker repeatedly sending ICMP packets to a network server. This forces the server to send an ICMP packet. This eventually uses up all the bandwidth for incoming and outgoing traffic and causes the server to crash. Both of the attacks we've discussed so far, SYN flood and ICMP flood, take advantage of communication protocols by sending an overwhelming number of requests. There are also attacks that can overwhelm a server with one big request. One example that we'll discuss is called the ping of death. A ping of death attack is a type of DOS attack that is caused when a hacker pings a system by sending in an oversized ICMP packet that is bigger than 64 kilobytes, the maximum size for a correctly formed ICMP packet. Pinging a vulnerable network server with an oversized ICMP packet will overload the system and cause it to crash. Think of this like dropping a rock on a small anthill. Each individual ant can carry a certain amount of weight while transporting food to and from the anthill. But if a large rock is dropped on the anthill, then many ants will be crushed, and the colony is unable to function until it rebuilds its operations elsewhere. In this video, we'll discuss packet sniffing, with a focus on how threat actors may use this technique to gain unauthorized access to information. Previously, you learned about the information and data packets that travel across the network. Packets include a header, which contains the sender's and receiver's IP addresses. Packets also contain a body, which may contain valuable information like names, date of birth, personal messages, financial information, credit card numbers. Packet sniffing is the practice of using software tools to observe data as it moves across a network. As a security analyst, you may use packet sniffing to analyze and capture packets when investigating ongoing incidents or debugging network issues. 
Later in this certificate program, you'll gain hands-on practice with some packet sniffing software. However, malicious actors may also use packet sniffing to look at data that has not been sent to them. This is a little bit like opening somebody else's mail. It's important for you to learn about how threat actors use packet sniffing with harmful intent, so you can be prepared to protect against these malicious acts. Malicious actors may insert themselves in the middle of an authorized connection between two devices. Then they can use packet sniffing to spy on every data packet as it comes across their device. The goal is to find valuable information in the data packets that they can then use in their advantage. Attackers can use software applications or a hardware device to look into data packets. Malicious actors can access a network packet with a packet sniffer and make changes to the data. They may change the information in the body of the packet, like altering a recipient's bank account number. Packet sniffing can be passive or active. Passive packet sniffing is a type of attack where data packets are read in transit. Since all the traffic on a network is visible to any host on the hub, malicious actors can view all the information going in and out of the device they are targeting. Thinking back to the example of a letter being delivered, we can compare a passive packet sniffing attack to a postal delivery person maliciously reading somebody's mail. The postal worker, or packet sniffer, has the right to deliver the mail, but not the right to read the information inside. Active packet sniffing is a type of attack where data packets are manipulated in transit. This may include injecting internet protocols to redirect the packets to an unintended port or changing the information the packet contains. An active packet sniffing attack would be like a neighbor telling the delivery person, I'll deliver that mail for you, and then reading the mail or changing the letter before putting it in your mailbox. Even though your neighbor knows you, and even if they deliver it to the correct house, they are actively going out of their way to engage in malicious behavior. The good news is that malicious packet sniffing can be prevented. Let's look at a few ways a network security professional can prevent these attacks. One way to protect against malicious packet sniffing is to use a VPN to encrypt and protect data as it travels across the network. If you don't remember how VPNs work, you can revisit the video about this topic in the previous section of the program. When you use a VPN, hackers might interfere with your traffic, but they won't be able to decode it to read it and read your private information. Another way to add a layer of protection against packet sniffing is to make sure the websites you have use HTTPS at the beginning of the domain address. Previously, we discussed how HTTPS uses SSL TLS to encrypt data and prevent eavesdropping when malicious actors spy on network transmissions. One final way to help protect yourself against malicious packet sniffing is to avoid using unprotected Wi-Fi. You usually find unprotected Wi-Fi in public places like coffee shops, restaurants, or airports. These networks don't use encryption. This means that anyone on the network can access all of the data traveling to and from your device. One precaution you can take is avoiding free public Wi-Fi unless you have a VPN service already installed on your device.